So, Paul, I'm pretty convinced it doesn't appear to be a planet going around Vega that explains that infrared excess. But, you know, when we look at a lot of stars uh, in the nearby uh, neighborhood of the sun, what we saw in Vega seems to be something we see around a lot of stars. For example, Formahalt, one of my favorites, Epsilon Eridani, and Beta Pictoris. And they seem to have this excess of infrared light. And in a few of these cases, where the stars are the nearest, you can actually look and see where it's coming from. So here, for example, is what's called a coronagraph image from the Hubble Space Telescope. They've blocked out the light from the star behind a little round disk here. And what you can see is it's coming from what looks like a line on both sides. Okay, wow. So it's really, really a very thin amount of material. It's not a big circle around it. Yeah, I mean, it could be you know, like a pencil sticking out both ends of it, but more likely it's an edge on disk around here. Okay, so this is Beta Pictoris. What about some of the other stars that I was mentioning? What do they look like? Well, here's a bunch of other ones. Um, what we're seeing here is the age of the star. And you can see you see these things in stars between uh, 10 and 1,000 uh, years old, um, million years old. And you know, there's some more that look a bit edge on, like Beta Pictoris. There's Beta Pictoris again. And there are some Vega you can't really see, but it's a bit spread out. And some that look a bit more elongated. So it looks like it really is a disk. So it's a disk, and we just see it at different angles. And it's not just young stars and old stars. It, it seems to be a range of different ages. So could this be, for example, the protoplanetary disk, the, the disk that planets form out of? Well, as you remember, we expect planets to form from a spinning disk of dust and gas. Um, however, this disk, first of all, is mostly gas, whereas these disks seem to be only dust, by and large, very maybe trace amounts of dust, gas in a few of them. So it's not the right composition. And secondly, the protoplanetary disks have usually gone away by about here, uh, in the first wow. five, two or three million years, very often, at most ten million years. Well, as you look at these, you start seeing them. They seem to be very, very common about you know, 20 million years, well after that, and then they become less dominant, but they're still out there at very long times. So it doesn't look like it's a protoplanetary disk. It's a different thing, what we call a debris disk. OK, so it's sort of the leftover from making the planets and stuff. It's sort of a debris disk left over from the formation of the, the system. Well, maybe, but there's a problem with that. Oh, OK. So there is a problem. The problem is that the dust won't stay put. So, Paul, uh, we know that the protoplanetary disks uh, are after they form their planets are essentially swept out by radiation pressure where the actual photons of the star literally impart their momentum and uh, blow the stuff out. And then we have the wind, the solar wind, where high speed particles also input you know, their momentum into stuff and we can clear out a disk. Doesn't that affect uh, the dust? Uh, around these stars? Well, indeed it does. I mean, it won't affect anything big, but a really small grain, whatever has got rid of the gas, should get rid of those as well. Um, not to mention having all the gas stripped away would drag them with it. So it's very hard to imagine this, these uh, dust is actually just the leftovers, so not perhaps completely impossible. There's also another mechanism which gets rid of dust very effectively, at least in our own solar system, which is called the Pointing-Robertson effect. Um, it turns out there's a lot of dust in the inner part of our own solar system. It produces what we call the zodiacal light, which is sort of a glow you can see on moonless nights. Um, and this is actually from collisions in the asteroids, produce small amounts of dust, and this causes it to rain down towards the sun. So this works the reverse of solar wind. It actually moves stuff in. How it works, let's see you've got a dust grain going around in orbit around the sun. To cause it to fall in, we need to slow down its velocity in this direction. Right. Adding velocity to that direction is not going to make anything happen. It has to actually be slowed down. Uh, and let's look at it from the grain's point of view. I mean, the laws of physics should work in any possible frame of reference. So let's look from the... Imagine we're sitting, having a ride on a micron-sized dust grain. Now, from your point of view, the solar wind is no longer coming straight out. You've got a bit of a headwind. So, so this like, is like going through a rainstorm or something with an umbrella and... You're getting things coming out at an angle from you. Yep. Yes, even if the rain's coming down straight, if you're running forward at a high enough speed, it'll uh, appear to be coming from in front of you. So that's going to apply a backward force, which will slow you down and cause you to spiral in. All right, so, you know, changing frames of reference is a little bit of smoke and mirrors. So if we go back to the reference frame of the, the star, of the sun, then it strikes me that uh, I'm a little confused. These lines are coming out at essentially right angles to the orbit. And so in that case, 
how does this work? We should be getting the same answer. And it seems here we're really just trying to push it straight out. Yes, like anything, it should work in any frame of reference. And in this case, as you say, the solar radiation pressure is not going to slow it down. Um, however, if you remember, back when we were talking about gamma ray bursts, if something is emitting radiation in all directions but is moving at the same time, oh. that radiation is beamed forward. Now, is this emitting? Yes, it is, because sunlight's heating, heating it and heating it up. And because it's a warm dust grain, it's going to emit infrared radiation. And that should be just the same amount of energy out as energy in. So it's going to be radiating, but because it's moving, that radiation will appear to be beamed into a forward direction. Ah, I see. So that's the difference. If I look in the perspective of the grain, I emit in all directions evenly. But in the frame of reference of the sun or the star, then I don't. But either way, you get exactly the same backward force. In this case, it's like a retro rocket. It's firing radiation forwards so that slows it down. In its own frame of reference, it's the headwind of particles that's causing it to slow down. Either way, it spirals in. So this is going to clean the dust grains out rather effectively. So we've got a problem. We need small dust grains to be able to intercept enough of the light of the star to produce these infrared excesses that we see, which are enormous. But if the grains are small enough to do this without some totally ridiculous amount of mass, then they're also small enough to be cleared out on very short time scales. So we, we've got these three effects. We've got radiation pressure, we have the wind, and we have the Poynting-Robertson effect. Which is the most important? In our own solar system, Poynting-Robertson dominates and moves dust inwards. In these solar systems, they've got A stars, which are very bright, powerful stars. So in fact, it turns out radiation pressure and solar wind are dominant, and it will actually sweep the dust out, typically. So, but any way you look at it, if there's dust there, it's either going to go out or in. It ain't going to stay where it is uh, right now. Absolutely. So, why is it there?